Welcome to Ballarat Libraries in Conversation, a series of discussions with authors about books and writing. My name's Anna, and today I'm going to be talking with author Wayne Marshall about his new book of stories, Sherl. First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work, the Wadarung, Jajawarung and Wurundjeri people, and recognise their continuing connection to the land and waterways. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend this to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Today I'm joined by Wayne Marshall, who is somewhat of a local author hailing from Bacchus Marsh. Uh, Wayne's stories have appeared in Going Down Swinging, Kill Your Darlings, Island and the Review of Australian Fiction. His story collection, Sherl, was shortlisted for the 2019 Victorian Premier's Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript and was published this year by Affirm Press. He is the co-founder of the Peter Carey Short Story Award. Wayne, thanks so much for talking with us today and congratulations on your book. It's really interesting, it's really unique, it's really original. Um, can you tell us a bit about it? Sure, well, um, for, for starters, thanks Anna so much for having me. Um, it's a real honor. Uh, so the story collection. Um, so there are 14 and a bit short stories in the book and those that have read the book will understand the 14 and a bit part that's sort of a half a story lurking somewhere in the pages. Um, the collection is a bit of a roller coaster ride through Australiana um, and on a more critical level it's a playful look at uh, white Australian masculinity within uh, an outer suburban and rural context. Uh, but it does so, it plays with this in ways that are comic and absurd and fantastical. So for instance, in one story, aliens invade and place a ban on AFL football for a season. In another, a grieving Yowie uh, goes looking for companionship in the town beneath his forest, only to end up at the town's desperate and dateless ball. Um, but there are also a few uh, metafictional stories in the collection as well. So for instance, in one, I look at, uh, I went through cancer uh, at the start of writing this book and through writing this book. So one of the stories looks at that as well. So a bit of a mingling of the comic and the deeper stuff. So hopefully there's the, the collection as a whole is a bit of a mixed bag, hence the roller coaster ride. Yeah, it definitely is a mixed bag, I think. Um, can you read us something from it, Wayne? I'd love to, yeah. So right. I'll, read, I'll read the shortest story in the collection. Um, and yeah, that way I'll be able to read a full story without reading just a section. So this story is titled Bruce. We're just a small country town. Nothing ever happens here. Although there was that one time a shark showed up in our public swimming pool. We called him Bruce fed him barbecued chickens from the IGA up the road. For a while, all the kids in the area held their 18th on the grassy slope by the pool, drinking and dancing while Bruce's hulking shadow swam laps at the deep end. We had photos taken of ourselves beside the pool, our smiling faces made more interesting somehow by the dorsal fin at our backs. When that ran its course, local fishing enthusiast Stumpy Taylor took to scaling the fence in the middle of the night and casting a hook baited with marinated steak into the pool. Bruce ignored it and ignored it until one night he had enough and tore the rod, fisherman and all, into the water, ripping Stumpy's left arm clean off. We stayed away from the pool after that, admiring Bruce for his take no shit attitude, but knowing he'd overstepped the mark. Seasons went by, years. The surface of the pool became a rolling swamp of mauled birds. The lawn beside it grew tall and feral. We figured Bruce was lonely, but by God, we were lonely too. And so life went on until one good Friday, Lynn Keeley's boy went riding through town, shouting that Bruce had gone belly up. We all rushed over for a look. Sure enough, Bruce had gone belly up. For a moment, we stood in silence, heads bowed, admonishing ourselves for taking so little care of the one interesting thing that had come our way in at least a decade. But then there was the beep, beep, beep of a truck reversing, and we all hopped out of the way watching as Jimmy Smeaton leapt from the driver's side and scrambled through the tall grass, his forehead dripping sweat as he winched the shark from the water and hauled him back along Main Street to his shop, where Bruce presides, still, to this day, 
a once wild thing reduced to a taxidermied head on a menu board, staring down on us every time we open the door to Jimmy's and step inside to pick up our fish and chips. I love that detail that um, people go and have their 18th birthday party in front of the swimming pool, because I just know that is exactly what they would do in a small <laughs> Yeah. Everybody yeah. does it. That's yeah, great. exactly. Um, so that gives people a bit of a taste of where some of your stories go. Um, where do you see your writing style sitting in terms of literary style? Do you um, think it fits into a particular category, like, for instance, surrealism or magical realism or fantasy? Yeah, OK. So there are certainly um, fantastical elements in, in the collection, as, as we saw there. So the magic, the, the writers that might broadly be defined as magic realists, um, Peter Carey, Franz Kafka, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, so those writers have been hugely influential. But since putting the book out and speaking about Sherl, I've also um, realised how much of an influence something more local has had on me. So I grew up in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, um, grew up around football clubs a lot. And the yarn culture, the, the, the culture of tall tale telling um, with all its exaggerations and humour and twists, uh, I, I see now how much of an influence that has come to bear on my writing, my writing style. So I guess I'm not sure exactly where I fit, but those two styles between the writers I just mentioned and the kind of um, storytelling culture, an oral storytelling culture that I come from, I think somewhere in there, the collision of those two things is where I belong and where my book fits. Yeah. And do you think that's a style that you will stay with? Um, can you see um, your writing continuing in that style? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can try and write straighter realist things and they turn out like this. So. <laughs> It just happens. It's not even a conscious decision. I just sit down to write and it's, oh, what if, what if this happened? And, and the grand, large storytelling style, it just happens. So, yeah, I, I highly suspect that I'll go along the same road. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I have to ask you about the title, Sherl, and I know um, that's a character in one of the stories. Um, but people have said to me, oh, is that based on Shirley Strong from the Skyhooks? So I, I need to ask you that. Is it anything to do with the Skyhooks, Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Shirley Strong or, okay. or Sky, But I think that's quite a funny thing, people picking up the book and assuming that it's somehow I, um, I mean, I think the cover would give it away as soon as people saw the cover that it's probably not about Shirley Strong. Yeah. But yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, it was. So um, there was a, there's a story in it, as you say, that um, one of the characters is titled Sherl and it's quite a, a telling thing and it's hard to speak about without giving um, plot twists away. Oh, um, spoiler alert, everybody. Exactly. Um, just look at the cover. Um, <laughs> but the, the collection, when it was shortlisted for the Victorian Premier's Literary Award, it was titled, it had a different title. It was titled Frontier Sport and it was only once a firm press signed the book, um, they indicated pretty quickly that they were keen for the for the book to be titled Sherl. So, I mean, it hasn't struck me that, that there might be some mix up with um, <laughs> thinking this is something else. So, so nobody else has that. asked you that. I thought no. I thought people must ask you that all the time. No, no. I mean, it, it makes sense now that you say it, but no, no. OK, oh. well, because about three people asked me if it had anything to do with that. <laughs> yeah. <I> <laughs> um, we also invited people from the community to submit questions to you, Wayne. And the first one I have here comes from Joe in Ballarat. Um, so, your stories all seem to incorporate the absurd with the ordinary. What draws you to the absurd? And is there anything you think would be too absurd? Okay. Um, what draws me to the absurd, I guess, is that's just been my reading interest since I was very little. Um, I'll, I've got some books here. I'm going to show these a bit later, but I, I guess one of the great, the bigger influences when I was young was reading the Paul Jennings short story collections. If people can see this, this is Undone and 
unreal. And, and there's a whole stack of those books. Yeah. Very much in that absurdist style. And there are some crazy things that happen done with a very Australian sense of humour and very Australian in their settings. So I guess my imagination was shaped very early on by um, these absurd things. So in terms of uh, combining that with the ordinary, I'm, I'm not so much of a fan of out and out surrealism. So I really want these strange things to be grounded in a recognizable reality. And for me, with all the stories taking place in the sort of the outer suburbs and in the rural small towns, those details like the one you mentioned with the swimming pool, um, they're key. I, I really want the stories don't live for me until they become real. They always yeah. start. The first image for me is always the shark in the swimming pool, the yaoi coming down the mountain, the, the, the aliens invading a town. But I really want them um, to come alive through that detail and, and for, that, for, that, for those things to collide with our local culture, to say something about that, like the mm. ban on football, which speaks about the football, the obsessive football culture here in Australia and Victoria. Yeah. So it, it's really key for me um, getting the, the, low, the, the ordinary details in. As far as are there any ideas that are too absurd? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, huh? I think that um, of the stories that I wrote for Cheryl, only one in four probably survived the first draft stage. The other three, the reason that they didn't survive it, I didn't continue them, is that they were too crazy. Yeah. <laughs> There wasn't um, a reality to them and it wasn't speaking to anything in the culture. Um, and, and these are things that come over drafts seven, eight, nine, ten of the book, but you do get a sense early whether this, this crazy image is going to have legs beyond just something novel. So yes. absolutely there are things that are too absurd and I'm throwing stuff out all the time because of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you did sort of touch on um, that a lot of your sto stories um, deal with themes of masculinity and Australian identity. Um, and I was just wondering where do you think, well, men are at and I suppose uh, where, where women are at too and where society's at, do you think in, in terms of masculinity, sport um, and those influences? Big question. Um... Yeah. <laughs> I think men, men are, as they've always been, quite strange beasts. Um, and that's a lot of the fodder for uh, my collection. So it is, it is quite a nostalgic book. It does look back, written in a time that was my childhood in the 80s, 90s, growing up. Um, as, for, as for men, yeah, I, 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 the book looks at a lot of that stoicism, the guardedness, the inability to be open and to express emotions. Um, I certainly think that's changing. Um, and in terms of just awareness of partners and kids outside of the obsessiveness, obsessions with things like sport, yeah, I'd like to think that's, that's changing too. Um, yeah, just more of an awareness outside, outside themselves. Um, yeah, to do with, you, you bring up women to do with their partners as well. Um, hopefully things are changing for the better, I sense that they are, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's, that's good. Um, some of your stories are quite dark in terms of relationships, I think. Um, but yeah, I can see that maybe um, that's just sort of a discussion that you're, that you're having. Yeah, I mean, Myself and a lot and a lot of my friends um, had parents that didn't stay together. Um, so I guess that was me traveling further inside myself, inside my own history as the book went on. I think the the darker relationship stuff came a little bit later as the book progressed, and I started heading more in an autobiographical way, even with crazy things happening within the book, trying to still get at something personal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that explains why there's a lot of that happening in the book, and it does look at, at relationships, yeah, why they why they fall apart. Yeah, yeah, um, and I loved that nostalgia that you brought into it. I haven't thought of McEwen's for such a long time. I forgot about <laughs> McEwen's. I think that brought a little tear to my eye. Oh, and yeah. bag. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. That supermarket. But uh, it was really nice to paint that picture of, of a bygone era and I could see um, that I think talking about masculinity and that sort of thing in that historical context um, gives you distance and gives you an opportunity just to talk about it, I guess, from a remove. Yeah, I really liked yeah. that part of it. Yeah, and, and a lot of that, so growing up in the 80s, even if you look at Australian advertising at the time, how they represented masculinity, it was so over the top. Like, if you think of the solo ads, solo man ads, if you remember those. Yes, I know, do. Guys emerging from the bush or from the ocean and the solo drinks dripping down these hefty moustaches. And, yeah. like, that just feeds this sense of the Australian absurd that I like to get into. It's... It's just so so far over the top that um, yeah, it draws me into it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's great to remind us of of that era. I, I love it. Um, we've got a question from Jess in Ballarat, and she's asking how much of yourself is in your stories. Yeah, well, I guess I was just speaking to that a bit. Um, the first few stories were perhaps a little bit removed from myself, but as the collection went on. Um, I started putting myself more and more in there, but still um, there's, there was a nice remove for me that they were personal, but um, they're about something else on the surface. So the stuff with me is quite, it exists in a kind of metaphorical, allegorical space. Um, there was a story, uh, Gibson's Bat and Ball, about the sports theme park. And it was the first, that, that was in an Australian journal, Going Down Swing. And there was a review of that, the first reviewed story for me from that. And um, it was commented that um, the theme park was a monument to a broken marriage, which is, it is in the story. And A, it's quite uh, eloquent, I think, to say that for me, and I still hadn't finished the collection at that point when that review was written, it made me realise that I was heading towards my own parents separation in the things I was writing just with that one line in one review mm. and that took me the book ends on a kind of fictionalized version uh, of my parents breaking up and I don't think I would have got to that without that review and so that yep. was the final story and that's obviously hugely personal mm. so I kind of saw see the collection as a journey towards that and and the story the, the collection finishes on that note yeah there's a, um, a couple of lines in the story, Levitation, uh, where you say, um, but also as a writer, more than anyone, I'm guilty of cannibalising experience for the sake of story, slanting it until it becomes something that satisfies my imagination. So I guess I would also ask you, how much of yourself are you prepared to expose in your stories? I guess those two stories. So Levitation is the story about um, me going through cancer and Weekend in Aubrey about my parents. And that would probably mark how far I'm prepared to go. To. <laughs> okay. What I'm working yeah. on now, what I'm working on now is, 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 is not that, is removed from that. So I was a little bit uncomfortable doing that. I sort of, they came quickly, both those stories and just rushed out, which was fantastic. And it was only until I was sort of polishing them. I thought, oh, should I really do this and put myself out there and other people out there? Um, so that would mark how far I'm prepared to go. And I think it was pretty far. So Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Toby in Dalesford. Um, do you imagine an ideal reader you're reaching out to in your work? And in a perfect writer-reader relationship, what type of person would you say you're writing for? Well, I think, um, no, I don't think I do imagine a reader. I think I'm writing for myself. I'm writing the kind of things that um, I've wanted to see, I guess, things that entertain and engage me. When I started writing for, for the longest time, there was this um, model of Australian writing, very a realist, lyrical, quite grim Australian short story. And that was the kind of short story that was um, almost the only short story for, for a few decades back there. But there are, there's been a change to that. There are a lot of writers now that are doing fantastical um, 
experimental things which influence me and the stories I, I, I just take off an idea and I think I'm entertaining myself first and foremost I mean I started writing it with the cancer diagnosis and that was purely to entertain me to get me through that um, I, I didn't imagine that there would be a book at the end of this I didn't imagine that any of the stories would see a reader so really um, I, I I guess I was just entertaining myself and that's kind of continued. I feel freer rather than thinking of what's another person going to think. I sort of yeah. want to try, yeah, just let rip a little bit and think yeah. about that up down the track. Yeah. Um, have you always thought of yourself as a writer or that you'd like to be a writer? Yeah, so when I was 15, I took up music. Music was really my first love and I played the guitar and wrote lyrics for a band and I played music for 15 years in bands. Um, it wasn't until I was in my mid twenties that I started trying prose, short stories. So I guess I've always wanted to be a writer of various description. It's always been there. Um, when my music turned into the songs were very narrative driven and very epic. Um, it was just seemed a very natural thing to go into writing prose. So yeah, I have for quite a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, um, with the, when your book was shortlisted for the Victorian Premier's Literary Prize, did that change things for you? Absolutely. Uh, I was kind of at my end with it a little bit. I'd, I'd written the story Gibson's Bat and Ball, which I talked about before, and I just, I couldn't write anything after that. It had been six months. I hadn't written anything. And I saw the VPLA for an unpublished manuscript advertised. It wasn't something that was on my radar, something that I'd been meaning to submit to. Because at that stage, I only had 35,000 words of a book, which is not enough. Um, I saw it. I tuned into four of the previous winners speaking about it. And one of those writers, Melanie Chang, who has a short story collection, Australia Day, who had been successful with it, spoke about having her short story collection at a similar size to mine at about 35, 40,000 words. So I submitted not really thinking much other than I need something to pull me out of the rut that I was in. And um, I received the call like five o'clock on a Monday night. I was cooking tea for my kids. There was mayhem in the house. The kids yeah. were squealing. And I got the call from the wheel center that had been shortlisted and it was just out of body. Um, yeah. I'd heard the writers who, who, who'd had success with it speak about as soon as the shortlist is announced that you're on it, you will hear from publishers and agents. And that just seemed fanciful, like a fairy tale. But when the shortlist was announced a week or so later, the same day I heard from six publishers, a few agents, wow. emails, private messages on social media. Oh, wow. It, usually it's the case of we're just scraping to get eyeballs from publishers on it, let alone them coming to us yeah that was it was amazing it was such a whirlwind it went for six weeks until the winner was announced and i don't think in that time i really even bothered to consider will i win this because with an unpublished manuscript award really you're sort of fighting to get the book signed for it to be published and to be represented by an agent if that's something that you want rather than short shortlisted if you book uh, for an award if it's been published already so I spoke to a lot of publishers. I signed up with my agent, Martin Shaw, who's over in Germany. Um, oh. It was an amazing six weeks. And, yeah. and, and that immediately fired me out of the creative rut that I was in. Because I thought, yeah, right. if I want the book, it's not big enough and I'm gonna need stories really quickly. So probably in terror as much as anything, I started writing and it just came, you know, the four or five stories that at the end of the book just came. So. Um, so are those stories different in style? Uh, did your uh, writing change at all after being um, picked up by a publisher? Yeah, so I wrote Levitation and Weekend in Aubrey after being um, signed by Firm Press. The deal the agreement was write four more stories in four months. Well, I'd written one story in a year. So I had to get cracking and I was aware that I wanted some different stories to fill out the collection because thematically it's, they're very blokey that there's a similarity to a lot of the stories. So I wanted to write, write one that was about an Australian woman writer that I've been dreaming of for quite a while um, that I wanted to write. 
And stylistically with both of those stories and tonally, there's a departure from the com more comic stories. And I just, I didn't have time to second guess it or fall into doubt, which probably I would have normally. I'd been considering, again, the cancer story for the best part of three years. And I just didn't have any time and I just leapt into them and they kind of happened and they were done and sent off and part of the book before I knew it. So yeah, it was Fantastic. great. Um, I'm going to ask you a question from Finn in Ballarat. He would like to know, how have you found inspiration to write while in lockdown and stuck at home? And I'd like to add to that, is writing the best perfect career for um, pandemic conditions? I think so, maybe. Um, so I've been a, a full-time stay-at-home parent for seven years. And in that time, I wrote Cheryl in snatches of time around doing stuff with my kids. Yep. So really, this isn't that different to me, the COVID time. Um, my kids are at home or a little bit more. I have a daughter who goes to primary school. Well, she's been off school and we've had home homeschooling for quite a while now. But it's still just the same thing of grabbing snatches of time. So. I'm not particularly out and about a lot. The social stuff, I'm a writer, I'm, I'm fine with solitude. Um, so yeah, this has felt quite normal to me and, and, and my moods have risen and fallen as they always do, which is on how my writing's going on any particular given day. So I have been working on something since Cheryl was published. Um, as far as motivation and inspiration goes, um, I've always found exercise to be really really key because I'm not out much. I'm home with the kids, but I think exercise is really key to the health of any writer. I would recommend it as one of the first things that any aspiring writer does coming into it to get an exercise regime that works for them. Yeah. So I started running laps at a local oval a few times a week once um, COVID hit the first lockdown in March, the weather was still nice. And so, I would write and it would give me ideas. I would run and give me ideas for the writing and keep that creative energy going because being stuck at home and getting lethargic can kill that a bit. So yeah, yeah, exercise. Yeah. Right, uh, that's good because um, we had a question from Jess in Ballarat that wanted to, well, she was asking about writing exercise, but I'm um, thinking that that answers that as well because you're talking about um, physical exercise to promote your ideas and so on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Levi and Ballarat would like to know which writers' festival you'd love to be invited to and why. <laughs> oh, um, I think I'd like to be invited to to Clunes, to Booktown. Ah, oh, um, I love that. Yeah, I um, I've only had the opportunity to go once, but I loved it. It's a great setting and a great atmosphere. And I do love the more regional festivals. There's, they're a bit more relaxed than the ones in the city. And yeah, Clunes is just beautiful. Um, yeah. So yeah, everyone's watching um, from Booktown. I'd love to come. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, we'll all be able to come and see you if you are there. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, the Peter Carey Short Story Award that you set up, can you tell us um, how that came about and um, you mentioned um, Carey's writing earlier. Has he been an influence on your writing? Um, so I'll talk about Peter's work first. Yeah, uh, Peter's collection, The Fat Man in History, um, which anyone who's interested in fantastical um, short story writing or heightened short story writing should absolutely check out, uh, was hugely influential to me. Uh, when I was in my mid-twenties, when I said I started prose writing, um, I was doing an arts degree and in one of those classes we received a handbook with various short stories in it and Peter's um, Life and Death in the South Side Pavilion, which is one of the stories in his first collection. And it was just like a transmission from an alien planet. It was um, very strange but a lot of the local elements in it, you felt that this was an Australian writer at work, but written in a way that played down the strangeness of it in a very detached reportage style. So I go back to, I think in answer to one of the earlier questions, if I am stuck, I go back and read uh, Carey's short story collections often. And, and I go back when I'm stuck because I still find them, they were written in the 1970s and I still find them so fresh such an energy um, and, and I'm so inspired by them. In terms of the Peter Carey Short Story um, Award, 
We have a writers group in Bacchus Marsh, the Morrible Writers Craft and the surrounding Morrible Shire. Um, in 2016, I think it was, the local library, the Bacchus Marsh Library, asked if we'd be interested in helping stage a writers festival, just something very small. Um, and myself and Jem Tiley Miller and a few other writers from our group helped out. And as part of that, they asked, would you be interested in doing a short story award, just something local, something very small. And it was one of those things where everyone was just piling ideas and, and suddenly it became, well, not just a, a short story award for those in Bacchus Marsh, but for Victoria, for Australia, let's open it up. And then someone said, well, you know, we have perhaps the greatest short story, Australian short story writer ever grew up here. How about we ask if Peter will put his name to it? Yeah. Um, and Jem, my friend, went and asked Peter's agent and he came back and said yes. And it mm. was amazing. So we've been doing that for four years um, and we re receive 350 stories again this year from all across Australia. So it's quite competitive. And we have uh, Mianjin, uh, Melbourne Literary Magazine publishes the two winning stories every year. And it's just been a fantastic experience. I'm still pinching myself that I'm involved in such a thing. Yeah, that it is. That's fantastic. Um, Wayne, I'm going to have to wrap things up. I feel like we could talk for hours more. There's so many more things I'd like to know, but um, maybe another time. Maybe it includes. Yes, exactly. Um, so thanks so much for talking with us today. And if anyone hasn't read the book yet, um, I would urge them to go and buy it or borrow it from their local library. And Wayne, we'll look forward to seeing what you produce next. And where can people find you in terms of social media? Yeah, so I'm on Facebook and Twitter. My, I'm not sure what the word is, handle, I think it is, is Wayne A. Marshall 1 for both of those. So people can find me there. And I'd just like to say thank you to Anna and to the Barra Library for having me. It's, as I said before, it's an honour and a privilege. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, and thanks to everyone who sent in questions for Wayne. And thanks for everybody who's watching this as well. And if you'd like to see more of our author in conversation series, check our books and reading page on the library website. All right. Thanks again, Wayne. And we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.